What's up everybody? This is Aaron from Aaron's Audio Corner and today I'm going to be reviewing the DIY Sound Group HTM12 V2. And last month I tested the V1 version of this speaker which is basically no longer in production. I just was lucky enough to get my hands on it through a fellow audiophile, you know, nut. And he has these. He lives local. He brought it over to my house. I tested the V1 and then a lot of people were asking about the V2. So the designer, Matt Grant, sent me the parts to turn the V1 into a V2. So here we are today. Now, I don't recall all the individual components that make up this piece. Uh, the website will certainly have all that information. So I'm just gonna kind of keep this at a higher level, discuss what I heard, discuss what I liked, and you know, possible ways for potentially improving it that the designer or the end user could implement and maybe make the speaker a little bit better for their situation. So with that said, let's kick this thing off. For those of you who are not familiar with DIY Sound Group, that is not a manufacturer. That is, as you would expect, a group of individuals who DIY designs, they get together, they make kits available through the group, DIYSoundGroup.com. And through that, you can order kits like this, and then you can put them together. So a kit for this speaker comes with the woofer, the compression driver, the large CO's waveguide, the baffle, uh, the crossover, and you can get the crossover assembled or not. You could do it yourself. And then you would order the additional enclosure to put it all together. And I cannot recall right now, but I want to say that the retail price is somewhere in that $400 region. Uh, and it may be a little bit plus or minus that. Now, currently, as of right now, the parts to build this speaker are not in stock, but hopefully, the, hopefully they'll be available soon. And when they are, you guys make sure that you check that out. And to DIY the speaker, you really don't need a lot. If you order the crossover symbol, then all you've got to do is just assemble the enclosure. And that just takes some wood glue and some time. The price is very, very low. You've got to put in some time to build the speaker, but it's negligible, really. Um, and once you do that, you get an incredible speaker, in my opinion. Now, the problems that I ran into objectively and subjectively uh, were namely in the lower mid-range and I, i'm trying to recall from memory it's like the 200 to 300 hertz region we'll discuss this when we get to the data shortly but it was very boomy and just resonant and i'm thinking that that's due to standing waves in the enclosure and i suspect that maybe bracing would help break that up but also some additional stuffing and maybe varying the stuffing. Like if you use the blue jeans denim insulation, which is what's in here, then also maybe you consider using like polyfill or the stuff that you could buy from Parts Express, um, maybe wool, you know, vary the insulation material up because that will really help do more to break the standing waves up than if you just use the exact same material. Um, the bracing, again, I don't know that that's going to help because I don't know if it's so much the cabinet walls resonating as it just is a standing wave inside the enclosure just lighting up. But I will say that it is absolutely audible and it truthfully annoyed the crap out of me. If I can get past that, so if, if those issues can be resolved, or maybe if you're just not like me where you don't notice those things and you don't pick up on them, then it's a, it's a fantastic speaker. But for me, that really would be a showstopper and I would have to spend some more time trying to implement, implement, implement a fix to get rid of that issue, which I do believe could be done probably pretty easily. Um, going on though, if you're working your way higher up through the mid range and into the high frequency area, this speaker is just incredible. And also let me fall back and mention that even though I'm talking about the resonance in the lower mid range and I tested a set of Klipsch Harris C4s. They're $3,000 per pair, and they have the same problem. Um, so it's not just this speaker because it's you know relatively cheap. Even expensive speakers have that issue as well. And I would take this over the Klipsch any day of the week because it's a lot cheaper. Anyway, subjectivity aside, going up, you know, the response is a lot more flat as you get higher in frequency. And the waveguide and, and the way that the crossover was built to implement the 12 inch midwoofer to the waveguide compression driver is really quite good. I mean, it does a great job with horizontal dispersion. Uh, it is narrow, so if you're expecting a very wide sound stage, you're not going to get that out of this speaker and most likely not out of most speakers that are like this because they tend to uh, compress the sound waves more toward the front so you get less side reflection. 
If you want more soundstage radiation, you're going to have to go with a speaker that has a broader dispersion, but that also brings in more room interaction and some may or may not like that. And this is where you get into the realm of preference. You know, this, there's no right or wrong when it comes to soundstage width and envelopment. Uh, it really just is up to you as the end user of what you like. Output wise, this speaker will, will freaking hammer. Uh, Measure sensitivity for this model is about 91 dB at 2.83 volts, one meter. And the distortion on the speaker is incredibly, incredibly low. The frequency response suggests that you're gonna need a subwoofer for this. The designer knows that. I think everybody in the DIY sound group community knows that. So you're still gonna need a subwoofer for the speaker even though you have a 12 inch woofer. That's just the trade off that you get when you have a higher sensitivity speaker you don't have as low of an FS, which means that the speaker doesn't play quite as low as another speaker of comparable size, but with lower sensitivity. Let's switch gears, let's look at the data. We'll talk about some of the things that I've mentioned and I'll show you what I'm seeing in the data that I like, maybe some of the areas of concern that I have, and then we'll come back and we'll wrap this thing up. Now we are looking at the data on my website. I'll drop the link to this below in the description. And let's kind of blow through and look at some things that I think are very worth, very worth? I think are worth noting. Uh, as with all of my testing, I use the Klippel Near Field Scanner. It is a state-of-the-art, about $100,000 USD uh, system that allows you to measure a speaker in a reverberant room, so a non-anechoic room, and get anechoic data. And it does this through some complex math, and if you're interested in learning more about this system, you can watch this interview that I conducted with one of the designers, Christian Bellman, who is a very bright young man. Um, I recommend checking that out if, you, if you've got time. The data is also in accordance with the CTA 2034 standard. It is a specification. If you want, you can follow this link right here and go download that specification for free. Also, it's worth noting that I have a series of videos where I discuss data and how you can translate it, what it means. I'll drop that series playlist up here in the card. You can check that out and do what you will with that in your own time. And that allows me to kind of hit the highlights here today and save us some time right now. So kicking things off, the Spinorama data, 2034 data for the HTM 12 V2. On axis response, um, yeah, it's not great looking at it. And we see a big dip here around 200 Hertz. And then we see a sharp dip here around 400 Hertz. But when you get above about 800 Hertz, it's really quite good. And the very interesting thing worth noting about this speaker is that the directivity indices all seem to follow the response pretty well. And we can tell that by looking down here at the, the dashed lines of a blue. Until about 800 hertz or so, you've got pretty good directivity response, and then you've got a dip here where it goes wide. Now, I don't know exactly what that is. I don't know if that's the woofer. I don't know if that's a standing wave in the enclosure. I don't know if that's a vent leak. And this is one of those reasons why having data helps you out a lot because standard, you know, gated responses won't allow you to see these kind of things. But this kind of data really helps you point to where an issue is in frequency. And then using some, you know, deductive reasoning skills, you can go through and start trying to identify what's causing that issue. And in this case, um, I think that the community is gonna be served well by understanding that these are issues and they are occurring in these particular areas. And maybe the group as a whole can go through and try to find where the issue is coming from, you know, whether it be the woofer or the enclosure or something else. But going up above that, then we have another discontinuity around 1.2 kilohertz. But above that, I mean, it's really quite neutral. And overall, I'm, I was actually really surprised at this speaker. It seems to do directivity really well, which means that it should work well with equalization. If the community can figure out where these resonances are coming from on this lower end down here that are very audible to me and, and quite annoying, if I'm being honest, you're talking about a speaker that really is gonna just punch way above its, its pay grade. I'm, I'm really truly impressed with the speaker overall if I ignore the low mid-range resonance issues. The listening window also follows the on-axis response extremely well. So I think that's another nod to the great implementation of the 12 inch woofer to the CEOs waveguide. And these CEOs waveguides are no joke. These things are legit. Uh, but let's keep going, look at some other stuff. Estimated in-room response. So if you're listening in the far field, this is kind of what you would expect to hear if the response was 
angled on axis. And I, I should also note that when I measured the speaker, I measured it at the reference plane of just below the tweeter line. So I, I want to say it's like an inch. I believe that's what Matt Grant, who is the designer, told me he designed for. And that's where I measure the speaker at. Um, if you, you know, kind of, if you can look past these issues in, in the 200, the four or 500 hertz region, and then look above that, uh, what we're looking for is a trend line. So this kind of flattens off up here in the high frequency area, which tells me that the speaker is going to sound a bit bright. Uh, how much is going to be dependent upon, you know, where you want to tow these speakers in or out at. And then also, if you have some absorption in your room, that actually may help to knock down some of this and make it more of a, a more linear uh, trend line. So that's something worth noting. And then this is the SPL horizontal. So the on axis and off axis response. Look how well the off axis response follows the on axis response. I mean, this is really, this is really quite incredible. In, in my humble opinion, this is really quite incredible. And I'm truly, um, I, I don't want to use the word amazed, but I'm just happy to see such a really good design come from a DIY community for a speaker that's about $400 or so shipped to your door, you know, give or take once you, you know, add in the other components of the enclosure and things like that. But yeah, I mean, 400 bucks or so for this speaker and it's performing like this, that's really darn good. And then let's go and look at the vertical response, which is basically just telling you, stay where I measure the speaker at, which is just below the tweeter level. If you've got multiple rows, then, you know, whatever, it is what it is. The people behind you are gonna just have to deal with subpar voicing, if you wanna call it that. But your ideal location is gonna be your ears just below the tweeter line. And this is a prime example of a speaker that will act well with equalization. I mean, you can see that these, these responses are really quite good. The directivity is just excellent. It narrows up, uh, not much through the mid range, but then by about 500 Hertz, it's practically constant directivity. Uh, it's about 40, if I'm eyeballing this, about 40 to maybe 50 degrees wide um, in total radiation horizontally. And that's not super wide, but it's good. And the thing is that it's very consistent across the board. You're not going up and down in radiation very consistent, really great uh, directivity here. Now we're gonna look at the impedance and the impedance suggests that you could actually use an AVR to power these speakers and you'll be fine. I mean, that's pretty darn good. A couple other things worth mentioning though are there's a couple blips in the response, just above 300 Hertz and then there's another one just above 400 Hertz and the one just above 400 Hertz actually looks pretty rough. Um, again, I don't know what's causing this, but I'm pointing it out so people can use that, maybe try to figure out the issue and get the speaker even better than it already is. And then the F3 is at about 67 Hertz relative to the mean. So you're gonna need a subwoofer for the speaker. Glow plot, horizontal radiation pattern. If I'm looking at this, I'm looking at 40 to 50 degrees is where the speaker's primary uh, radiation lies. And it's actually pretty good. We already discussed this, but it's just another way of looking at the response here. And here are the series of distortion measurements, 86 dB, 1% uh, THD is at negative 40. So reference point, negative 40. So you're well below 1% at 96 dB, you're still well below 1%. And then at 102, you're still below 1% down to 60 Hertz. So this speaker has practically no distortion. All right, CSD. I normally don't provide this data, but I am in this case because I want people to understand the resonance that I'm talking about when I say I hear resonance in the lower uh, mid-range area. And this graphic does a good job of explaining that or, or illustrating that issue. And you can see at about 250 or so, you've got some sound that is just not dying off fast enough. I mean, if you look at all the other sound, this sound is hanging on for a very long time, 40 milliseconds, that's a long time. So there's gotta be something done here, bracing, stuffing, I don't know, but this needs to be worked on. If this were resolved, this would probably be one of my favorite speakers thus far. And then if I added EQ to it, uh, I mean, we're talking just some next level stuff. Now dynamic range. The dynamic range of this speaker, it's got some problems. And notably, it, it kind of sinks out in the resonance areas that I discussed earlier. Normally when I see compression like this, um, it's, it's due to some kind of port resonance. And so we may be seeing port resonances here, I don't know, um, but it's worth noting that these areas kind of give you a tip toward areas to fix in the response. This right here, to me, 
is probably an indication more of just the uh, crossover region. So the crossover is about 1250 hertz. And I'm going to guess that the tweeter is probably just experiencing some compression here. About a half a dB at 102 dB is not really that bad, but it is worth noting. Now, you could increase the crossover point, but that would mess with your directivity control. I would take the directivity control that this speaker has over fixing this half a dB compression. And that's just my personal opinion, okay? It's not going to be a perfect speaker no matter what you do unless you spend a lot of money, but that's the trade-off that I'm willing to take. The long-term compression, again, you're seeing this issue around 400 hertz, and it follows back up to the resonance that we're seeing in the impedance. So something's going on around there that's causing you some issues. And then at 96 dB, you're still seeing it. You've got some other things going on which are kind of perplexing. I'm not really sure what's causing these guys. Um, I did double check my data, and I did run another set of tests just to make sure that the tests were not corrupt. Same thing. So I'm not sure what's going on. But here's the data if somebody wants to investigate that. And that's it for the objective data. Let's switch over and end this thing. Okay, let's recap. 330 bucks, I just looked it up. 330 bucks for the kit and that shipped price. That gets you the baffle, the crossover components, and the drivers and the CLS waveguide. If you want to order with the assembled crossover, then that's gonna cost you a little bit of extra money. But let's just say that you do everything, and let's say it's 400 bucks per speaker shipped to your door. Uh, $800 for the pair and now you know what you get and in my opinion you really do get a great speaker if We as a community or the designer could figure out how to resolve some of those resonances that I mentioned Then I think you're talking about you know a really good speaker Going up to an incredible speaker and if you have equalization you can use that to help kind of smooth out the response a little bit um, I wouldn't use it to work on the resonances so much. I still think you need a mechanical fix there but equalization can help smooth out the response a little bit more. And the combination of those two, I mean, sky's the limit, you know? For the price, I don't think it can be beat. And I'm really curious to see what comes out of the DIY sound group going forward. You know, if, if there's somebody out there who can maybe take the design and put it up to the next level, like a V3 or something like that, and, and get it more sound quality oriented, because as it is right now, even though most people using this are using it for a home theater. I have a home theater, big old high sensitivity compression drivers from JBL. I mean, I love loud music. I love loud home theater stuff. But with that said, the lower frequency resonances are enough to deter me to not use this speaker as is. As I mentioned earlier, I would definitely have to make some tweaks to resolve that. But I do believe that those tweaks can be done and can resolve it and can make this speaker just another notch up higher. I'm going to end it here. If you guys like the video, please leave me a thumbs up. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing. And if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. I will definitely drop the manufacturer's link to their product page in the description. And I will drop a link to the written review of mine in the description as well. And anything else I think is pertinent, I'll try to drop down there as well. Thank you to the local fellow who dropped these off to me. Thank you to Matt Grant for sending me the parts to uh, allow me to upgrade this speaker and thank you DIY sound group community for you know being open to somebody providing you with objective measurements and maybe working toward the goal of providing everybody with some great sound. I'll talk to y'all later. Peace.